So we have four sections left. We have eight, three, four, five, and six. Um, the four sections left are not challenging. They're foreign. Um, they're awkward because we're looking at vectors and a lot of people don't know what a vector is. So when I throw at you a vector operation, you get caught up in the idea of I've never dealt with vectors and so you kind of forget the simplicity of it. The only way you're going to be good at this is to practice it because it's actually not bad at all. It's just foreign. It's strange. It's new. You've never seen vectors or you could have but it's been a while. Um, so you're really going to have to get like laser focused because it's not something you can tune into in the back of your mind and then still do well with that you've seen over and over. It's something you've not seen, okay? Um, but it's completely doable. The mid-chapter 8 exams, I will give back to you and let you look at them once everyone takes it. Um, and then... We will move on from that exam and focus on the end of chapter 8 exam, which is what will probably be next week. I know Friday, good. I know Friday of next week on the 5th will be a wash. I already know that. That's fine because my son even has a field day that day, so maybe I should put a collar on it to just kind of. I'll just, well, that's not Maybe I should just mark it out. Uh, let's do this. I'll do this. Okay, so I realize Friday is going to be a wash. So your, your tentative schedule is you're looking at the end of Chapter 8 exam, probably on the 3rd or the 4th. Okay? Because we should be fine to finish the sections this week. Um, and then whatever we need to wrap up on Monday review test. You with me? So the end of chapter 8 exam is before prom. I got that? Okay. And then the final exam will be the week after prom because I don't want to rush this. We have no reason to rush it, so we're not going to rush it. You're looking at reviewing on the 8th, final on the 9th. Unless y'all feel like you're not ready, then we can take the final on the 10th. We've got plenty of time. Yes. Which one is it? Is it Shell? Oh. Is it first thing in the morning? Okay. Well, we'll worry about when we get there. It's not. It's not gonna. I'm not gonna put you at a disadvantage. Yeah. Are you um, teaching on Friday? Where a lot of the children are doing all their normal school work, the seniors? I didn't know that was Friday. 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 So it's not going to interfere with day. Senior skip day is with girls, usually the Friday before prom, all because of appointments. Well, I have that special visit too. That's what day is that? That's that Friday. The 28th? Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll just, once you know what time you're, like, have to be there, just let me know. Okay. We'll just play it by ear. Okay. They won't give those out until um, the last two weeks. Final exemption forms are the 10th. Mallory, final exemption forms are the 10th of May. Say it's the 18th or the 19th. For what? Your last official day. 
Because y'all's finals, I think, are the 18th or 19th. And you have to take their final, I think, it's those two days. Which would make sense. Are y'all's finals here? Okay, so then your last one. Is that, is that legit? Okay, so then your last regular school day is the 19th. And if you have to take finals, you'll have to come on Monday, the 22nd, or Tuesday, the 23rd. Um, Friday the 19th at night? Yeah. Then we'll have another practice at like Y'all see the night is the nineteenth, and then Ralph Reese's graduation for pre K is the nineteenth. It's all gonna be a hot mess that day, like you and y'all don't even know. <laughs> How is it gonna work oh. after you take the final? You're not. Wait, what? I only have this class, so like, are you just gonna mark me present for the day? I can't mark you present, but you're at because. Because if we have a lot there on the fire drill or whatever, that's my luck we would. Um, but your absence is not going to affect you. Okay. Yeah. So your grades will be done. And once we take our final, our grades Wait, but done. like towards final or towards um, like not exam um, forms? And yeah, exemption forms. forms. It doesn't right? matter. I'm signing y'all as exempt. You have to take my final anyways. Not your final. I'm talking about final for like tardies and like grades. But I'm her only class. Other than work days. Oh, now that's, that's, so that's, a, yeah, that's between you and, you have to use one of the work days at the end of the year. It's literally like eight questions. She does not show up at the end of the year. At the end of the semester, everyone has to take at least one, she said. So just, that, that's between you and her. Yes, but I was talking to her. So I have like, oh yeah, she'll tell me her and then I'm like, and I'm like, and I'm like, and I'm like, early in those years, like, five minutes. Just let me know when to expect you so that I don't get a text. You have kids sitting in your room and you're not in there. You know what I mean? Just text me. Not a problem at all. And if you go by Starbucks, just text me and I'll place a mobile order. Just tell me what you want. I got it. We have teacher appreciation. All right. Um, so let's look at A3. We're not doing all of A3 today because, like I said, it is forward foreign i keep saying that word it feels like i'm saying it wrong it's awkward um so i don't i just kind of want to get your toes wet you know what i mean um to dip your toes in the pool it is absolutely not complicated it's just awkward when we're looking at it okay now this might ring a bell you did this at some point in geometry although it's been a while and it was probably one single day out of geometry because it's so simple there's no way to make it more challenging we are looking at graphing complex numbers let's remind you what a complex number is if you have a highlighter um, it may be worth highlighting if you need one i have plenty um, i got Restocked. So if you need a highlighter, raise your hand. Anybody? Um, a complex number is exactly what it sounds like. It's a number that's complicated, complex, and that's because it has a real part. That's a highlighter. Hold on. It has a real part and it has an imaginary part. And obviously a real number and imaginary number are not like terms at all. So you can't like combine them. So you just shove them together, you know, and it just looks weird. So for example, two plus three I is a complex number. Two is the real number, three I is the imaginary number. The nice thing about complex numbers, although they're awkward, is how do you differentiate between the real and the imaginary? The imaginary number literally has an I next to it. Like you can't, you can't get it wrong. It's true. Um, it's standard to write the real number first, the imaginary number second. What we're going to look at is graphing them. You need to know that the x-axis stays as the number line, 
just standard real number lines. You're already used to that. The y-axis is what's considered your imaginary axis. <coughs> so I'm actually going to highlight over here too. So the x-axis is where we look for real numbers. The imaginary axis um, is the y-axis. So some examples are shown to the right. So look at this. From the origin, 0, 0, if I was to plot the, real, um, the complex number 3 plus 2i, which is right here, it means I'm going to go right 3 and then up 2. Straightforward. Um, if I was to plot negative 4 plus 3i, I'm going to go left 4, up 3. If I was to plot negative 4i, there's no real number, so that means no right or left, and I would just go down 4. So, you try. Here are some examples, and here's a graph. I'm sorry that the grid did not copy, so just do the best you can in terms of like the grid in the background. I want you right now to graph all five of these. You've got 3 plus 2i. So this is your real axis. This is your imaginary axis. label these right next to it. You don't have to do that. I just wanted you to know um, where my points are coming from. So remember the first number, if it has no I, it's your right or left movement. The second number with an I is your up or down movement. Um, the first two are straightforward. get to C and it's negative 3i which means the real number is 0 which means there's no right or left movement you're just going straight down on the imaginary axis when you get to E there's no imaginary part at all, so it's the equivalent of 2 plus 0i, which means you're just moving right to and you're staying put. There's no um, up or down movement. <coughs> okay, going to the next slide. Now these formulas are going to, there's a lot of formulas here. You are not going to be expected to memorize them. I have a formula sheet for you. I'll copy it today so you can go ahead and start using it for your homeworks. Um, this formula is finding the absolute value of a complex number. Remember absolute value is the measure of the number from the distance from the number plotted on the graph to the origin. So if you look at this, this is the absolute value bars right here. And then to find the actual absolute value, it's not a matter of just dropping, the, like y'all are used to what's the absolute value of negative eight? Eight, because it's eight units away from the center, from or, the origin. 
absolute value of negative 14, 14. You're used to something as simple as that, right? Okay, well, with complex numbers, it's not as simple as just, oh, you drop the, the negative and it just comes out. It's an actual formula. It's the square root of the sum of the two values squared, which should look really similar to the distance formula if you're at all hello, one squared plus minus y1 squared. That's the distance formula. You, you should be used to that. That's from geometry as well. But it's the same concept if you look at it. Instead of having, though, multiple x and y's, we just have the single real term and the single imaginary term. So it's the exact same concept. All right, so let's look at it. Remember, find the absolute value right here. This tells me to go to my formula, so I'm going to set it up. This is, so if the absolute value of this is going to be the square root, now it's a squared plus b squared. Can't really mess those up because they're just getting added together. But a is technically the real term. b is the coefficient of the imaginary term. Don't you dare throw the i in there, okay? It's the coefficient of the imaginary term. So you might want to make a note if you're worried you're going to throw the i in there, that it's just the coefficient. And then you type the whole thing in your calculator. In this case, it's pretty. Or you can do it in your head. You've got 9 plus 16, square root of 25 is... Let's do another one. Let's find the absolute value of this. So watch your negatives. Mallory, watch your negatives. <laughs> yep. So if, if it's negative, when you go to write it down, it needs to be in parentheses if you're going to type the whole thing in the calculator based on what you wrote. I need you to understand, and I'm going to come over here and change colors. Um, not, and then square root, I'm going to write this, like, you, this is not accurate, because if you go to your calculator and you type this in, it's not going to square a negative, it's going to square the two and then negate it, and so that's totally wrong, so make sure that you put it in parentheses, or if you're already like, you know, this is, can you get something more challenging? Then you know that the negative is a moot point. You could just write your number itself without the negative. Because you know it's going to get squared, which means it's going to become positive anyways. So the negative is really not important at all. So please don't get this wrong because of the negative, because it should be disappearing. Now, when you go to type this in the calculator, you get a decimal which tells you pump the brakes, go back, and actually find it by hand. Or type just the part under the radicand, like the, the radical, type just the numerical part, and then write what you get. So let me show you. Uh, let me pull my calculator up. While that's pulling up, I'm going to pull my homework so I can go ahead and let you know the way they want their answers. <laughs> they want the answers in radical form. They don't want decimals according to what I have on my paper. And you're going to want to start tonight's homework tonight because there's 17 questions. Although I'm looking at them and none of them are starred as higher level of difficulty, but there's 17 questions. Alright, 
So watch this. So if you type the whole thing in. And you get a decimal. You need to um, either do it by hand or type just the radican in. The radican is the part under the radical without the actual square root. So I'm just going to repeat the part under the radical without a square root. And you will always get a nice number if you do that. Then you can say to yourself, okay, so it's actually the square root of 5 is the answer. And that's as simple as it gets. You can't go any further there. So you might want to make a note. Um, inner radican when it's ugly. And what I mean by that is if you went and typed the whole thing in and you got a decimal, then go back and just type the radican and you'll get a pretty number. All right, look at the next one. We're going to find the absolute value of this. When you first look at that, it's probably awkward. So let's rewrite it. What's missing? The real number is missing, which means it was a zero. So if it throws you off to have it missing, rewrite it as zero plus that imaginary part. If it throws you off, you don't have to. It's going to be the same thing. You just, when you go to your formula, you just, you only have one part that you're squaring. So we're going to find the absolute value of this. We've got zero squared plus four fifths squared. Zero squared, like we said, is just irrelevant. That's zero. If you're familiar with your radicals, what happens when you square root something that's squared? They're going to cancel. They're going to cancel. We're going to be left with four fifths here. But let's say you didn't catch that. So one, you can go to your calculator, type square root four fifths squared. You get a decimal, math bracket, math bracket. Four fifths. It comes from the fact that four fifths squared is 16 over 25, and the square root of 16 is 4, and the square root of 25 is 5, so it's four fifths. So, multiple ways to get there. You could recognize that those operations were undoing each other, or you could go to your calculator and type it in. Whatever you're comfortable with. Just watch your negatives. Watch your negatives. All right. Now let's go to the last new part. So I'm going to show you the last new part, and then we have just practice problems to make sure you know how to do it, okay? So, last new part. And this is where it's it's that awkward because you're just not familiar with it. All right, so look right here. We actually, we haven't hit the vectors just yet. We're still looking at just trig here. Um, for some reason, somebody said, let's, let's find trig values of complex numbers. That was a good joke. Um, and so, that's what this is. We have a formula right here. We have the trig notation for complex numbers, which means if I gave you a complex number and I asked you to tell me what it is in trig form, it would come out looking like this. I know that looks really awkward at first. Let's go back up here and let me show you where it comes from. Take your highlighter. So first of all, don't write this. This should look familiar. And if it doesn't look familiar, let me refresh you. From the, the traditional triangle drawn within the unit circle or just in, in general on the plane, 
remember that the radius is always the hypotenuse. Just remember that. Remember that um, you've got your x-axis and then your y-axis, which now we have as our x-axis and our imaginary axis. So what used to be the um, x and the y is now the a and the b. Okay. So that instead of x and y, we have a and b, and they're in the same order. They didn't confuse us. And so the coordinates of this point right here, which we plotted on the first slide, is a plus bi. And the distance from the origin to it is the radius or the hypotenuse of the triangle formed if I was to lay it out. Okay. What I want you to highlight on this slide is right here. I want you to highlight this and this. And now I'm going to explain to you where it comes from. Remember, cosine is the x coordinate over the radius. Remember, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent to theta is always the x axis, the hypotenuse is always the radius. So cosine theta equals a over r. Y'all used to see it as x over r. Remember that? That was on your formula sheet for that one trig test y'all didn't like. All I've done is cross multiply the r over here to the front to get this. You see that? So instead of having to, so if I said to you, what is the a coordinate on this trig ratio? Um, you can simply plug in the radius and the cosine and you can type it in your calculator and you can tell me. Instead of having to set it up and then cross multiply, I've already given it to you as a formula. Same thing over here. Sine used to be y over the hypotenuse. Now it's the imaginary part over the hypotenuse, the radius. And so you cross multiply this to the front, you get this. Okay. And I'm pretty sure those are on your formula sheets, um, as well as this right here. I also want you to highlight this, this whole box, because this is new and foreign. I want to draw attention to it. Okay, and then look right underneath it. If I say find the trig notation for a complex number in standard notation, a plus bi, you have to find the radius, then you have to find the angle theta that satisfies the formula sine theta equals b over r and cosine theta equals a over r. I know right now you're like, what? Wait till we do a practice example, and then let me know if you're confused. Highlight that, go to the next slide, and let me show it to you in practice. Did I copy that? It's not on this one on yours, is it? Okay. I must have copied it over and left it there. So... This right here is what was on that last slide. If you will write that maybe at the top of your paper so you don't have to flip back and forth. So the trig notation of a complex number is R parentheses cosine theta plus I sine theta. All right, now that you've written that down, now let's practice. And there's not a lot of writing here, but we, we are going to write more than we really need just because it's the first practice problem, and then you'll start to get the hang of it, okay? So if I say, find the trig notation for this complex number, you would go to your formula sheet and look for the formula that says trig notation of a complex number. Okay, here's the complex number, 1 plus i. We need to know what a and b are. So
So if you look at it, A is what? 1 and B is, in this case, is also 1 because there's an understood 1 right there. Does everybody agree? first thing we want to find is R. Remember on that last slide right here where it said in order to find the trig notation we must find R. It's the first thing you find. What is R? R is the hypotenuse or the distance from the complex number to the origin. What's another word for the distance? The absolute value, right? So this formula right here, if you want to go back to this slide, now that you know there's an R, I didn't want you to write it yet because I didn't want to throw you off. If you want to go back to this slide, you can come over here and put that R equals the absolute value. Okay? So I'm going to copy that to right here. I'm going to write R is the absolute value of A squared I'm sorry, of a plus bi, which means the square root, a squared plus b squared. So let's plug it in. 1 squared plus 1 squared. So square root 2, right? And you do want to leave it as a, a radical. You don't want to use a decimal. Leave it as a radical. So, so far we've got part of our answer. Our answer, I'm going to come down here and just go ahead and write it. I'm going to label little r. And then we have cosine theta plus i sine theta. This is me letting you know our final answer. We just found little r. Square root 2. goes right there. Now we've got to get the cosine theta plus I sine theta part. We need to know, if you go back to the last slide, we need to know what is theta. We need to know the measure of the angle that is um, formed from this complex number. How do you find that? You use the cosine and the sine formulas and the concept of that triangle being drawn. These values right here. This is how you find it, okay? Go back, go right here. All right, let's set it up. So cosine theta equals A over R sine theta equals B over R. Do we know A? One. Do we know B? We know R? Alright, plug it in. So 1 over square root 2. 1 over square root 2. Now you do need it rationalized. And everybody should know what that is rationalized. Square root of 2 over 2. So I'm going to put or square root 2 over 2. Here's the question. Either write in a different color, or once you write this, highlight it. From this, right here, from that, remember, that's your x coordinate, cosine your x, sine your y. So you're going to say to yourself, where on unit circle is... Now, what did we find? We found cosine theta is root 2 over 2, and sine theta is root 2 over 2. What angle, now you should know this off the top of your head, but if not, pull up the unit circle. What angle on the unit circle has an x coordinate positive root 2 over 2 and a y coordinate positive root 2 over 2? That's 45. So my answer, I'm going to draw an arrow to say, like, my answer is theta 
is 45 degrees. So now I have, I have my theta. Now I can write the formula. Look at the formula for the trig notation. It's R parentheses cosine theta. My theta is 45 plus I sine theta. And that's the answer right there. Once again, like I said earlier, it is awkward. It's, it's very um, new, new to you. So it feels weird. But there's a formula and you just plug it in. Okay, the really, the only like inference part where you have to take what you know and answer a question is right here where you say to yourself, what I just found cosine and sine to be what does that come, what angle does that come from on the unit circle? <coughs> Alright, let's do another one. Go to the next one. We got square root 3 minus i. So, you say to yourself, what's a? What's b? A is square root of 3. It's ugly, but it's square root of 3. What's B? Negative 1. Be careful. Find R. R is going to be the square root of A squared plus B squared. Watch your signs. Put it in parentheses. I think you could type that radican in your calculator and you should still get the right answer. Let me type it real quick to make sure. Squared. And that would be squared minus, no, plus. Negative one squared. Yeah. So if you're not comfortable here with simplifying a square root and a square that they actually just cancel. Um, you could type the radicand in the calculator. I have a random extra parentheses in the front, ignore that. You can type the radicand in the calculator and it will give you the simple number. Just don't forget that that's under this big radical right here, okay? Don't write equals 4. It's the square root of 4, which is, what, 2. See that? All right, so we found R. Now we're going to lay out our cosine and our sine. So cosine, always do cosine first because remember that's the x coordinate. Okay. Cosine theta equals a over r. Sine theta b over r. Plug it in. A is square root three. R is two. B is negative one. R is 2. Go back here. Say to yourself, where on the unit circle, and if you need to write it together, you can. So where is your x coordinate was positive 3 over square root of 3 over 2 your y coordinate was negative 1 half so we're looking for square root of 3 over 2 and negative 1 half so that's positive then negative which tells me I'm in quadrant 4 and it's right here which means it's you see that? So theta is 330. Theta is 330 degrees. And now you're going to write your answer. So remember, the formula is, let me 
change to a, I should have done this thinner to make it look better. The formula is R parentheses cosine theta plus I sine theta. That's the formula. So right above it, I'm going to write the answer. R is 2. Parentheses cosine theta is 330 plus I sine 